Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ask Julie Anything, our April session. This session is going to be extra special because it marks a celebration of Earth Day, Earth Month, if you will. Um, and Julie has always considered Earth Day as almost, almost, Julie, you've compared it to Christmas for you. What Earth Day is to you is comparable to Christmas to some of the rest of us. Um, it's a very special day for Julie. And so she wanted to kind of make AJA this month really reflect that. And um, you've had some slides put together that you're gonna talk about tonight and really help us figure out solutions and things that we can do to move forward in a healthier way for ourselves, for our animals and for our planet. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna take Q and A. Um, as always, everyone, a couple housekeeping items. Can you switch your chat to everyone so that we can all join in on the conversation here? And if you have questions for Julie, do me a favor and add them to the Q&A area at the bottom of this webinar. And I'll, I'll do my very best, I promise you, to, to keep tabs on all the Q&A and we'll try our hardest to get through all of them. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight is the April edition of Ask Julie Anything with a special feature on Earth Day and Earth Month. Julie. All right. Pardon? I was gonna say, without further ado, the floor is <laughs> yours. Okay, thank you. Um, it is, it's been a very, very interesting day today. Um, I have for, I, I think I might've um, uh, spoken about this before, maybe even my in my last AJA, I was trying to get, a Ukrainian couple over and um, they've arrived and it's amazing, but she is 40 weeks pregnant. And um, so today I spent the entire day at the hospital with her having her OBGYN uh, appointment. And it was very heartwarming and um, reflective, I guess I would say, because I, I feel I feel really, um, I feel so lucky that I can be part of their lives. And I, and I, I really can't even tell you how, I can't even explain to you what these people went through to, to get here. Uh, this, this woman was 36 weeks pregnant and had to walk literally from the Ukraine to Moldova, which is the next country by foot. And and just when I when I think about it, and I think about all all of the things that we take for granted with with our with our incredible um, uh, earth that we live on live in live on live in, um, and our families and our animals and our health and our our um, I don't know. I just, it really, it really makes me when I'm with them and in the, in the struggle that we've had to bring them here and everything that I've been trying to do to get them here during in the middle of a war. Um, it just makes me really sit back. And when I hear simple struggles, even the struggles that I'm having, or even the, 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 the things that's been so big to me, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty sensitive person and something very small can, can feel really big for me. And when I, when I think about what they went through, it makes me stand back and go how insignificant, um, so much of what upsets us are, is. And so today, like Stephanie said, um, the, Earth Day is a huge thing for me. It's, it reminds me of my mom. And um, my mom was a huge nature advocate and was very, very adamant and incredibly um, fiercely protective of the earth and fiercely protective of all animals, whether they were 
they were dogs, cats, horses, leopards, you know, mice, it didn't really matter, birds. So it makes me feel really close to her. And we didn't have Earth Day. That didn't, it wasn't a holiday. It wasn't a day that was celebrated. So the fact that they're, that they created a celebratory day was really exciting. I remember the first time that it was actually in existence and I was more excited than Christmas because I felt like to celebrate earth to me was to celebrate everything that, that, that I believed in everything that I stood for everything that, that we all get to share and experience that has nothing to do with gifts or presents. It has everything to do with the gifts that we actually have right in front of us every single day. So I'm going to go through some stuff um, and then I will take questions. And I was saying to Stephanie, when I first decided that I wanted to talk about Earth Day, I was, I was worried about making it too gloomy and too, um, to Debbie Downer, you know, the things that are lifting now with COVID and people want to get outside. And, and I, and I really didn't want to make this feel super gloomy or super um, depressing. And when I, a common theme when I'm listening to people uh, around global warming or around the state that the planet is in, the common theme is that people feel helpless. They feel helpless. They don't know what to do. So instead of doing anything, oftentimes they just put blinkers on. They don't want to look. They don't want to see. They don't want to read. They, they want to pretend like it's not there. And pretending like it's not there is a reaction because you don't know what to do and you don't know how, how to face it. So I think that there's lots of ways that we can all look at it and face it and so the two the two I'm actually going to do some slides and I'm going to be super super honest with you guys I left early this morning thinking that I was going to have lots of times to work time to work on my slide and I literally got home half an hour ago Stephanie was texting me where I where am I where am I and and I was really just held up all day um at the hospital so I haven't even really looked at my slides since Stephanie sent them. So I hope that they're in order. And for anyone that's heard me talk before, you know, I'm going to basically be reading them. And um, I, I think, I believe that, that the two things that are in my wheelhouse when it comes to the environment and me feeling like I can contribute to the world is the ocean and forests. So those are the two things that we're going to talk about the most today and how you can understand why they're so important and then things that we can do to try and to try and um, alleviate some of the stress, not only on us about what we can do, but alleviate some of the stress and give back, give back to nature. And I, and I do think it's really, really important <clears throat> for anyone that knows a drug beast, my motto is that we, we have this company because of nature. And I've been able to help through my vet hospital, literally thousands and thousands, 35,000 animals while I was in practice. And I don't even know how many thousands of animals and, and people that I've been able to touch since um, I, I, I've had a drug beast apothecary. So through that, I couldn't have done any of it if I hadn't been educated and used natural products and natural ingredients and, and the wisdom from Mother Nature. And I feel that people that are in this industry and people that are in this field and people that have the ability and the, 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 the grace and the, the, luck, I even want to say, to be able to treat their dogs or treat their families or work with nature. I think a lot of times they aren't understanding that we are, we are taking from nature and this is how we're making a living and how we're making our animals and our families better, but how much are we giving back? And I feel like this industry should be giving back 
a lot or because we wouldn't have this industry if it wasn't for nature. So part of what Adored Beasts mandate is above almost anything is that whatever we're doing, that there's a synergistic process of how we get from A to B and are we making sure that when we go from A to B that we're we're giving back and we're not just taking. So um, I'm gonna go through some slides actually that we use to do some training um, with our potency, with, a, with our LG uh, fish oil. And I've removed, or Stephanie, thank you, Stephanie, has removed anything to do with our oil because this isn't a, um, this is an this is not an advertisement about the oil, but what it is is it's education of why it was so important for me to find an alternative to fish oil, and this is a huge part of true sustainability. And so we're gonna we're gonna get. I'm just without further ado, I'm gonna just start start the. Um, slides. I'm going to blow through them super fast. If you want them, we can send them to you, right, Steph? If, if, if I'm going through them too quickly, can we send them to people? I can, yeah, I can put them on the Facebook group for sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. And so if I'm going through them too fast and then after, um, hopefully we'll be able to uh, have some questions and ask some questions about it. So do you want to let me share now? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And if I'm making, if, it, if it's not going to work, then I guess you can just go through them, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we'll move this here. I just want to move this up here so I can, actually what I'm going to do is make it even smaller. Hang on a second. I may have to make this even smaller. There we go. All right. So the first thing I want to talk about is our oceans. And um, sort of making everyday Earth Day, which is what my hope and my dream is, is that every day that we can wake up and take two minutes to look out our windows, feel cotton sheets in our beds, feel wood that our beds are made of or you know anything like that and realize that everything uh, many things in our in our daily lives that we take for granted like our electricity like when we turn water on when we turn our stoves on when we look at our iPhones all of that is from mother nature if we didn't have electricity if we didn't have water if we didn't have furniture basically everything that we are that gives us our freedom and our ability to function the way we want to function in our in our comfort actually comes from the earth so there now we're, there we go so this is kind of yucky um the health of our oceans is vital to all life on earth earth's vast expanses of water are key to the success of all life on earth we eat fish from the ocean, we benefit from its carbon, we breathe the oxygen it gives off. Without a healthy ocean, humans, their adored animals, and all the ocean life cannot survive. And I don't think people understand that, but it is actually true. If our, if our animals in our oceans die, the oceans won't survive. And if the oceans don't survive, we don't survive because as you can see, it is vitally important for our survival. So it's by far the biggest reservoir of carbon on earth. Without the oceans, we have no oxygen. And it'd be really cool if people could start putting in um, um, in the chat maybe, or, or in our questions, how many people actually knew that without oceans, we don't, we wouldn't have oxygen. Um, fishing vessels emit, emit a staggering 270 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. It's equivalent to 51 coal power plants. So while we are picketing for, you know, our, our, our air to be 
um, healthier and, you know, to, to decrease the amount of cars. And we actually are putting 270 million tons into the air just from the fishing, just from fishing boats. When you take the smaller fish, the bigger fish are impacted. Then the large animals like polar bears who rely on the bigger fish are impacted. This throws off the entire balance of so many different ecosystems. This is not just about the ocean. Without fish, the oceans will collapse as will everything else. It is just seriously a domino effect. Fisheries around the world are showing signs of overfishing and there are questions around long-term viability of these stocks. One of the biggest issues with fishing industry is the use of fish for fish oil and things like destruction of krill populations. So this is, I just wanna to talk to you about sustainability and this is not to point fingers, this is not to do anything, this is to try to teach you. There's something called um, uh, greenwashing and sustainability is something that is not, um, it's, another, it's another catchphrase many, many, many times. So a lot of you, again, I would love, love, love for you guys to put into the questions or put into the chats, how many of you know or think that when you hear sustainable, you assume that sustainability means it's protecting the earth. I think a lot of people do truly, really, truly do feel that. And that's not true. So more times than not, sustainability means that it's sustainable to the industry within, with, within its, its um, wheelhouse. So sustainability for um, wood, let's say. That's not sustainability for our forests or sustainability for our ecosystem. Sustainable forestry literally will go through it, means that they figured out a way that they can cut down all the trees and then the trees grow again, then they can cut down the trees again. Sustainability with fishing means that they're trying to figure out a way that they can just sustain the amount of fish for the industry and for, for um, the fishing industry. It doesn't mean that they're sustaining the oceans and the other animals and, and its ecosystem. It means nothing about, nothing like that. And it means that it's sustaining the actual industry. So let's, let's take krill for an example. Many marine animals rely on krill as their food source. Krill feed on phytoplankton and to a lesser extent zooplankton, making nutrients available to other animals for which krill make up the largest part of their diet. Blue whales, the largest animal on earth, have grown so because they are able to take advantage of the wealth of krill and plankton in our oceans. If they, if they lost their food source, we would lose them as well. Many people believe that the krill industry is sustainable when in fact it's the krill fishing industry that's sustainable, not the krill populations, which is what I just said. So we hear things like the limits are set to protect the krill population and allow for removal of one to 2%. It doesn't sound like a lot, does it? But because of climate change, and as our oceans get warmer and warmer, krill are already dying at an exponentially rapid pace. Continuing to fish krill at all, even at one or 2% is absolutely detrimental to the ocean animals, like unbelievable. And if you see at the top, our populations of krill have decreased 80% since 1970. So even, the thought of it being sustainable, we're, we're looking in, at a snapshot right now of what's happening. And that snapshot is this big when global warming is killing krill at an exponential, an exponential rate. So there really is no such thing as sustainable krill. Uh, research shows that penguin population could drop nearly by one third by the end of the century due to the changes in krill biomass. So um, there are choices. So I wouldn't be telling you this if there wasn't choices. If I was to come out and say to you guys, oh, it's really, you know, please try not to eat fish. Please try not to use fish oil. Please do this, please do that. That would be kind of hardcore for me. 
even though I might have believed it a few years ago, and I may have even talked about it a few years ago, but then I kind of shut up because I felt like I was stressing people out because I love my animals just like you guys do. And to think of not using something like fish oil to help with joints and to help with hearts and help with brains is a little bit hard to think about not doing that and not having an alternative, but now we do. So when you choose a supplement and food, considered the food chain, which is really interesting. As ocean life make their way up the food chain, their toxic load naturally increases. The smaller the organism, the smaller the toxic load, the big fish eat the little fish, then they turn, take, and then in turn they take on their toxic load. Algae is at the bottom of the food chain that's less contaminated, while fish and the oils they produce naturally contain a higher toxic load. And again, the reason that I'm talking about this is because if we can just even do one thing that doesn't affect the ocean exponentially in a negative way, and you guys go out and you say to people, you know, hey guys, there's an, there's an alternative to fish oil and it has, you know, just as much DHA and just as much EPA and it's less toxic and it's grown on land, you are making a difference along with a bunch of other things I'm going to talk to you about, but at least there is something that you can, you can, you can do to reduce fishing. So nothing in the ocean is truly sustainable. If we take from the ocean, it can't replace it on its own at the rate that we're taking it. The only way to protect the oceans is to leave them alone. And I mean that we shouldn't be touching the oceans. They know what to do. They need to be left alone and give time to, re to recover. By growing algae on land, we're not only where we are not harming the ocean and the ocean life or the ecosystem within the ocean life. We're committed to finding a way to get precious omegas without sacrificing the life of the ocean and thereby life on earth as we know it. Um, I think, I know you guys have heard me talk about, and I know you, you have read this, about how our livers are um, able to regenerate. Think of the ocean kind of like that. So, so instead of us going in and pretending we know what to do, because we really don't, um, gone too far with the oceans. And we are in this space where we, the more we do, it's not helping anymore. And what will help is is if we leave them alone, like really, really leave them alone, not try and figure out ways to have sustainability and all that in the oceans, but we need to leave them alone. And really quickly, really quickly, they will recover. They, the ocean will recover on its own without our interference. The less we interfere, the better they are. So microalgae provides the benefits of fish oil, but can be sustainably grown. Okay, I've read all this, sorry. So our past and our present and whatever remains of our future absolutely depends on what we do now. And this is a, an oceanographer and this is a, a horrible picture. And I, and I hate, I really hate showing this and I'm not trying to do this as, as fear tactics, but I am doing it because I feel like there's this fine line of, of not really understanding where we're at and being able to understand where we we're at and look at something like this and go, okay, you know what? I want to support how to fix this because we can, we seriously can rather than looking at this and going, oh my God, I can't look at this because I, I, I feel so small and helpless that I don't feel like I can do anything but you really can and it doesn't have to be huge or life or, or paralyzing. So our forests. Now, all you guys, I shouldn't say all you guys know. Um, so with Adored Beast, I, I do know that you know that I have an incredibly amazing partner that supports me financially to do what I need to do with, um, with Adored Beast. And Adored Beasts isn't about just our dogs and cats and horses. Adored Beasts is about all animals and, and nature. And I, um, 
I believe wholeheartedly that as a community, Adored Beast community, our holistic veterinary community, our holistic industry, we have to start looking at how can we produce things that support our industry rather than take from our industry. So I'm going to go through what our forest gives, and then I'm going to tell you one thing that I'm doing that I am trying to um, help with our forests. So forests are life, are, are life, literally. Forests can provide 30% of the solutions to keep global warming below 2%, 30% of the solution. So when you think about the two things that I just told you right now, forests and oceans, 30% of it is our, is our, is our forests. And a massive amount of it is our, like 80% of our, of our oxygen comes from, comes from our, our, our oceans and the cooling of, of our oceans. Like our, our oceans cool, um, the carbon creates the balance in the homeostasis in our climate. So when you look at those two things, ocean, oceans and forests, to support both of those, you guys are making massive, massive changes. So our, our, our forest provides habitat for wildlife. It help, helps remove dangerous greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. It reduces soil erosion and helps sustain the environment. The fewer the trees to help absorb carbon from the atmosphere, the earth's temperature rises and the effects of climate change increase. Sustainable forest management, improved land tenor, conservation, and restoration all help to preserve forests as a natural climate solution. 80% of the world's animals live in the forest. Human activity is driving extinction at a rate of 1,000 to 10,000 times beyond the natural. That's, um, that's huge. Just like seriously, everybody take a breath for two seconds and read that line because it, it, it is an absolute fact. Forests are critical homes for plants and animal species. In turn, those species play a critical role in maintaining the health of forests. That is a, I wanted to try to highlight that and I didn't know how, so I didn't do it, but I'm glad I remembered. That's another really important part. And it's another important part of how I look at life in general. In turn, those species play a critical role in maintaining the health of the forest. So I've said this in my sustainable lecture, if people don't care about whales, because believe it or not, there are lots of people out there that don't care about whales and they don't care about fish and they don't care about wildlife and they don't care about bears and they don't care about butterflies and they don't care about lizards and they don't, they don't really care they care about the human race and they care about um, the extinction of humans, but they don't care about animals. But what they don't understand is without fish and without the ocean animals and without bears and without the, the animal lives within forests, there are no more humans. Because when those two things are toast, which we're coming close to if we don't smarten up and wake up, there will be no people because there will be no oxygen. And the, the devastation of, of earthquakes and forest fires are, are, you know, when I was a kid, I would, you hardly even heard about for, for, for forest fires. So whether you have friends or neighbors or this is one thing you can do to make a difference is you can educate people. You can tell the naysayers or you can tell the people that aren't animal lovers or fish lovers or mammal lovers. They have to understand it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they like them or not. If we destroy them, we are destroying ourselves. Um, changes to forests. So, so that thing that I always talk about that, that critical the critical role that we all have 
when I when I have when I look for ingredients for adored beast, those ingredients have to play out how that that plant or that ingredient would grow in nature. Because I, I believe, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is that everything is so connected and so synergistic that we're living in a space of homeostasis. And we all know what that means, but we're living in the space of homeostasis of the world, which means that the world's homeostasis collapses, our homeostasis collapse. So we need to support everything from our soil to our forests, to our oceans, to our environments, to our, our gardens, to our everything. We have to stand back and try and get educated in how nature survives. Because if we can shift our thought process and learn from nature how nature has survived, and we take their lead instead of us trying to make nature take our lead, we're going to be in a completely different, way more positive space. Changes to forested habitats can lead to the extinction of species that depend on them, drastically reducing the resiliency of the forest biodiversity. As we clear cut forests, we deprive those animals. Changes in our forest, change, forest industry and the environment. Changes to our forests have long lasting, far reaching. Clear cutting's main purpose is to convert forests into farmland, to harvest timber. Large proportions of the Amazon have been way for large scale cattle grazing operations. One thing that you could, there's another thing you can do. Have like one meatless day a week start to eat plant-based plant-based diets, plant-based meats. One, if every family or every person had one, just one day of not eating meat, the amount of cattle and chickens and space that gets clear cut to create space to grow meat will be reduced beyond imaginable you if you can imagine if you just put it out there and try to not eat meat for one day or not have you know talk to your friends and and do something like that you are making a difference you might not think that you're making a difference and maybe you're thinking that plant-based diets are just really good for us and stuff which they are a gazillion percent but you are making an impact on the environment and you're making a positive impact for the future of the earth. Logging companies build roads in heavily forested areas to accommodate the bulldozers and heavy equipment needed to remove the old growth trees. Our logging industries often don't focus on harvesting in a sustainable way and loggers cut down more trees than, than can be replaced through natural growth or tree planting. This causes severe damage to forests and our environment as a whole. I want to speak to that too, because when we take down, we go into an old for an old growth forest, and depending on where they are, there'll be different trees. But they go in and they cut down all the trees, everything, and then they plant the same tree. They plant the same species. So they aren't they aren't sustainably far logging, or they're not sustainably, that, that's not a sustainable forest. That's sustainably supporting the logging industry because forests need diversity. Just like everyone hears me talk about gut diversity and the different, different bacteria, that's what the forest needs. Animals need different kinds of trees, different kinds of plants, different kinds of um, everything. Everything that dies in the forest, like the leaves that go into the ground, and then the mycelium of the mushrooms, and then the mushrooms grow, that, that diversity is paramount for a healthy forest. We don't just need a forest full of the same tree, like your, like wheat, because that's basically what it's like. It's like a field of wheat, or a field of pine trees, or a field of hemlock. We need a diverse mixed 
forest. And that is not sustainable logging, which is what 99% of, of, of logging is. So deforestation compromises watershed health and the increased risk of floods and droughts, more frequent and severe forest fires. The cost of clearing forests, commercial forest industry must regularly harvest transport, process large quantities of wood and practice clear cutting removes all trees from a tract of forest land. So now you might be looking going, how are we ever supposed to make an impact on that? I looked at some statistic and it was crazy that the average house, average wage household changes their kitchen, revamps their kitchen every five to 15 years. So what that means is that the average household, average wage household decides that they want to redo their kitchen every five to 15 years, which means taking out and throwing out perfectly healthy wooden cabinets, perfectly healthy wooden flow, healthy, perfectly, like perfect wooden floors. So before you do renovations in your house, you could maybe step back and go, is this something that I need to be happy? Or is this something that I need to step back and really try to figure out what is it in my life that I need to have a new kitchen every X amount of years? Could I just do a facelift on my kitchen and change the color or change the, the you know, the, the, the cupboard doors or whatever? Really trying to understand and walk through life and look at a piece of wood and go, that was a tree that was actually a tree and that tree could have housed squirrels and it could have housed birds and it could have housed, it could have sheltered deer and their fawn. We, we have been raised to walk through life with blinkers on and never have we been taught to look at our commodities and look at our, our everyday life and understand that that came from nature and what did nature sacrifice to give us that? It's the same as kind of looking at meat, right? I'm not saying people should be vegetarians. That's not what I'm saying. But when you go in and you look at those steaks and you look at those chickens, how many of us look at that or how many people teach their kids that that animal gave their life for us? Not, we aren't taught that. We aren't, we aren't taught to look at the world like that. We're not taught to understand every piece of paper, every paper bag, every, everything that gives us safety, comfort, security has come from nature. And I think that's a, that's a big thing that you can teach your children. You can teach your little sisters. You can teach your little brothers. You can teach your neighbors is just to be aware to walk through the world aware of what nature is actually giving us. So the mass removal of trees increased the soil erosion, okay, uh, 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 soil erosion by water runoff, excess runoff mutters, muddies waterways and aquatic life. So what does that mean? It means that when there's no trees, the mud, the, there's nothing to hold the soil in the ground. So when it rains, all the mud comes down and that mud is not supposed to go into rivers. It's not supposed to go into oceans. It's not supposed to go into lakes. And when it does, it screws up the, uh, the aquatic life, the, 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 bio, the biomass, the, the ecosystem within, within the water. The removal, of, and then it, that's a domino effect, right? So that then that is, is destroying and harmful for our oceans and our water. Removal of trees, shading streams, raises the water temperature and lowers, it, lowers its oxygen levels to the detriment of fish and other aquatic fa fauna. The soil decreases in quality. So what that means is, that's not rocket science. If we don't have trees shading the ground, shading watersheds, we are, we are allowing soil 
in areas around forests to heat up. It's one of the reasons for all of these forest fires is because there's big massive patches of land that heat up to a level that is unnatural. They're supposed to be, it's supposed to be forested land or at, or at least sporadic trees to keep the temperature down. We're, we're creating these horrific forest fires. And, and, and when you think about, I mean, I don't know how many people are out there from BC, but I mean, I just moved away from BC eight years ago. And when I saw the floods in BC and the floods that are happening all over the world, those floods are happening because of of us because because we aren't thinking before we're doing we're not understanding the domino effect of yes okay clear cutting but what clear what does clear cutting do what does it do to our soil what does it do to our environment well it is killing people we're having flash floods people are dying animals are dying um, people are having to leave their dogs and their in their in their their homes behind and their animals behind and their animals are drowning. It's intense. It's it's really intense. It isn't. It's no longer about the tree hugger. This is this is no longer about the nature lover or the tree hugger. This is about us waking up and seeing what we're doing as humans and trying to fix the wrong for humans, for, for human life, because there is no separation between human life, animal life, wildlife, and, and nature. So what can we do? Be mindful. So everything's connected. Think about how it impacts first. And that's what I was saying you know, not just looking at our labels, but looking at every single thing that we touch and going, did this come from nature? Did, am, I, am I drinking this water and where did this water come from? Well, it came from, it came from nature. It came from the earth. You know, I'm, I'm using my cell phone. Well, my cell phone is using water. It's using energy. Energy, we are taking energy from our planet. So being mindful of what we're using, but also looking at your labels. So don't buy things unless you know that they're 100% sustainable. And what does that sustainable mean? Is it greenwashing sustainable? Or do they truly mean that their sustainability, it, the importance of their sustainability is not that they sustain their ability to sell you products, but that it sustains our world in our in our wildlife in our ecosystem in our in our earth so figure it out ex what exactly certain logos mean and try and understand them so that shouldn't be paralyzing right that is something you can do everybody's on the internet constantly is just go on and look at what labels and if it's a if it's a sustainable fishery fishing thing and it's uh, it's from the fisheries. You can bet your bottom dollar. <laughs> it has nothing to do with sustaining the world or the environment. It has everything just to, to, to sustain the industry. And the same holds true for the majority of sustainable forestry. So stop eating fish and using products that come from the ocean. Remember, we need to leave our oceans alone. That sounds hardcore, and it is. <laughs> but I feel like for people that are, that we have to, it's like, it's like understanding that we may have to give something up. And is that the end of the world? Is it the end of the world if we have to give up something that we enjoy eating in order to impact our planet in a positive way? I know I know for some people, you might go, oh my gosh, I could never stop eating fish. There is no way I could stop eating fish. Then we need to step back and go, how much, how often do you eat fish? Do you know the fish that you're eating? Do you know exactly, you know, what, what their netting systems are? Do you know if they're catching, you know, so tuna, right? The amount of 
other animals from birds to dolphins to tortoises to thousands of other fish that are caught for tuna and just destroyed and thrown back as garbage into the ocean is is would blow your mind. So try and just do your research. If you're not going to say I'm not stopping, I'm there's no way I'm not going to stop eating fish. Then at least do your research and when you see that dolphin friendly thing, you have to remember it means it basically means nothing. It just means that they are self-governing themselves of how many dolphins that they catch. It's not it's not even it's not even policed. So just try, you know, I always say watch the movie um, uh, Seaspiracy. If for any of you out there that really want to know more, there's a, a documentary on Netflix called Seaspiracy, and I would highly recommend that, that you watch that. Um, recycle and reuse as much as possible. So paper, plastic, glass, wood, make sure that anything that you can stay, that can stay out of the landfill is kept out. And not only are you trying to not put things in the landfill, you're trying to not have, not be so consumable. We're so, the fact that we're so consumable, we are using our resources, even if we think it's clothes, right? So even if we're, if we're purchasing clothes and we really don't need to purchase those clothes, um, and I'm not trying to make it sound like, oh, you have to, everyone has to walk around with like holes in their clothes and, and stuff like that. But I do, I do know that we don't often think about when we purchase anything, clothes or anything, what is the impact on the earth? That's, that's really all I'm saying is I'm not telling you not to do something. I'm, a, I'm asking you just to take one minute, step back and go, if I purchase this or if I do this, what is my impact? Um, be mindful. We all play a role in protecting the earth. Reduce your meat consumption, which is what we talked about. Explore alternative energy sources. That's not my wheelhouse, but like solar and, and um, you know, our, that's something that you guys are going to have to research even more on your own because I can, I feel like I know my wheelhouse is the ocean and the forests um, and, and I'm getting there when it comes to soil. Uh, but when it comes to alternative energy, I would really recommend that you look at that. Use more eco-friendly cleaning products. This is a huge one, huge one. Things like apple cider vinegar and baking soda. Stephanie, she's always so amazing. She said to me, you know, my only, before I met you, my only thing about buying eco-friendly stuff was I thought it was so expensive. But you can use things like apple cider vinegar and baking soda, and it is a rocking cleaner like it cleans so well and it doesn't go into the ground and poison frogs and 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 destroy butterflies and go into our into our earth and into our water our water system it's it's or that's one little thing that we can all do that isn't expensive it might take a bit more time it might take you know 15 minutes to mix up a not even five minutes to mix up a container of it, but it's, it, you're making a difference. If every single person just does one thing to make a difference, it's a huge impact. Purchase food from no-till farmers and smaller organic farms. Billy Hochman and I are doing, I don't even know what it is, sometime this month, we're doing um, uh, a, a talk about about food and soil and things like that. So if you want to dig in a little bit more and learn a little bit more about what no-till farmers and small organic farmers, why that's important for not only our health and your dog's health and your cat's health and your horse's health, but why it's also really, really important for our environment. Um, I really love this little, this little saying. It's from a, an Indigenous tribe that's unknown, actually. It says, tell me and I'll forget. Show me and I may not remember. Involve me and I will understand. That's a biggie. Because for me to sit here and lecture to you, which I feel like I'm kind of doing and I don't like doing that, um, 
you might forget half of what I'm telling you. Um, I can show you and you're still not actively involved. But when you get involved, even if it's a tiny little once a month, once every six months, you get involved in something. And involvement, you know what involvement is too? If involvement is getting yourself educated and then telling a neighbor. You're getting involved. You're, you're creating an energy. You're creating a, a, a movement. You're creating hope. You're creating, um, I don't know, it's like the spark of joy and hope because we have a lot of hope and we have a lot to be joyful for and we can do a lot and we just cannot get paralyzed in, in our fear that we can't do anything and we can't shut off our minds and our eyes to what's really happening in the world because it is happening. But we can make a difference and we can turn it around by, you know, one making one simple conscientious heart centered choice. You're instantly becoming involved of the bigger picture of saving the planet. So I'm going to stop talking now and I'm going to stop sharing my screen or Stephanie, can you stop it for me or do you want me to stop it? I believe I can. Just um, here. Okay, hold on. Here, I can stop it right there. Oh, right. There that was wonderful, Julie. A lot of really, really nice feedback from the community. So thank you everyone for joining us. Um, there was one thing I wanted to share with everyone here. Julie mentioned the event that she's doing with Billy on regenerative agriculture. I'll give you the link here if you want to sign up. That's on Thursday, April 21st. Um, so it's the day before Earth Day. So we're just kind of keeping the theme. And, and that session is going to be on regenerative agriculture. Thank and, you. And always, and always like, like I just, I, I love the fact that we have this community that that cares you know and i and i think that it's just an expansion of of our i think you know i i don't want to get emotional because i i will every time i talk about my mom <laughs> my mom used to be a very big believer in um resilience and evolution and always evolving like I think it was about four days before she died. I was having a conversation with her about COVID and she was a big believer that COVID was, um, was going to be almost like a, um, I don't want to use, I don't want to say savior, but almost like a, you know, people are talking about it as a restart and whatever. And this was too, this was at the very beginning of COVID when she died. And it was heartbreaking, but incredible for me to hear her say this because I couldn't be with her when she died. And my mom, because of COVID, and my mom was a single most important being in my life and was the most incredible, kindest, brilliant woman I've ever known. And for her to be, and, and I was supposed to be with her when she died. I was her, I was her, um, her, what's that called? Power of attorney. I treated her for everything. Like she, my mom would go to the hospital and wouldn't let anyone touch her until I was on the phone. And for me not to be able to with her, be with her, I mean, I'll, I've been through a lot in my life, but, and, and people have been through worse but it was the single worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life that I couldn't be with my mom when she died. And about two days, three days before she died, she said to me, it's, it, I feel like COVID is going to change the world for the better if people just evolve and listen. And I was almost mad at her for a brief, like instantaneous second because I felt like saying to her mom, how can you say that? It's because of COVID that I can't be with you right now. And like we were FaceTiming and we were on Zooming and stuff. And 
she said, I know, I know, but I feel, I know that it has to happen. It has to happen for us to evolve. And I feel like every time, no matter how big or how small um, our AJs are, or like when Billy and I are t- going to be talking, or if I'm lecturing anywhere, I feel like we have to think about evolution and not evolution, not science evolution. Evolution of the way we were, were supposed to be evolving. And I feel like nature now is, is trying to give us a little bit of a wake up call that we aren't evolving. We're actually moving towards distinction and not evolution. And it's pretty clear. And um, if anybody is a Jane Goodall fan, like, like I am, and my mom was basically Jane Goodall's, um, uh, my, my mom and my sister uh, was Jane Goodall's host when she would come to Toronto. And when COVID first started, she she put on you can still see her videos and i think i have it somewhere on on youtube but um where she believed that it was our well she didn't just believe she said that that scientists and doctors have been warning us about covid for years and years and years and years but and we're ignoring it and if we don't pay attention it it's happening for us to pay attention to it and whether or not governments are jumping on the bandwagon to make more money or whatever you want to believe in that or you want to believe, it doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, there's not a lot of talk about how COVID really came to be. And we do know, and there's tons of scientific evidence about why. And what we do know is that when we shrink and crowd, we get species zoonotic diseases that jump species to species. And the world has never been, isn't, isn't, nature isn't built to overcrowd and, and overcrowd and overtake. It's, it's built to synergistically work together in life and death. And through that life and death, things develop and grow. And we are creating a very, very toxic, scary world where we are consuming and pushing and shoving all of our wildlife and our sea animals and our people into small spaces. And we're creating diseases that we don't even know what to do with. So yes, we can create a vaccine for this one disease, but as we've already seen, that that virus is way smarter than people and mutates and and just outsmarts us faster than we can come out with a vaccine. So it's got nothing to do with, I'm not, I'm not saying we shouldn't be vaccinating. I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing anything, but I think we should be paying even if we took 10% of the money that's going into vaccines to look at why it's here and how to prevent it from a perspective of what are we doing wrong in the world that we're getting these kind of viruses, we would then see what nature is trying to teach us and we would be able to evolve. But we're not evolving. We're staying really small. And no matter how much money, science, and effort is going into figuring out COVID, we are so ignorant in our approach to how do we pre- how we prevent it because we didn't it's not it's not the way we're going to get out of it but there's lots of people that are looking at it saying it it is a restart it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a time in the world for us to sh- sh- like literally shut down stop and look at what we're doing And if we really want to look at stopping diseases like COVID, we need to look at why it's, why it's happening and how do we, how do we prevent it? And I think the answer is in nature and not taking something from nature to create a vaccine or to create a drug or to do whatever, but 
trying to hear what nature is trying to teach us because I think she's trying to teach us how to continue to evolve and not destruct. So anyways, that's it. And do you want to open up the questions or yeah. Stephanie, or do you want yeah, to do I would love some to. chat stuff or... You know what, Julie, there's one interesting one here to build off of what you said, and it's asking about like, what kind of things should we look for in products when we're going yeah. to be purchasing? Is it like a Leaping Bunny certified? Do we look for organic? How can we be better conscious of our environment while we're shopping? Um, do you have any, any tips for, for us there? Yeah. So, I mean, the first thing is to try to buy as much local as you possibly can. And, you know, I'm not saying anything negative about organic because I would say 90% of what it, 90% of what's in Adored Beast is organic. And because we have nutraceuticals, which can't be organic because they're, they're natural ingredients that have been, um, certain things have been extracted from them. So they're not in their entirety. We can't, we can't, well, we can't, we still can say that we're organic, even though we it doesn't matter when we rebrand for everybody that's out there, we are rebranding as organic because I was putting my foot down because not every single solitary thing in our products were organic. And then it's like, okay, well, 99% of the things out there right now that are saying that they're organic are sometimes less than 20% organic. So when you look at organic, organic is wonderful, but if you are local, you're probably able to find more traceability. So if something that is made, even if it's made local, you'll be able to like, like come to me and say, okay, where did that come from? How did, how was it sourced? How is it traced? How's it, do, how is this done? How is that done? So you'd be able to talk to a person, to a person rather than a chat where, it's coming from anywhere in the world. So try to small businesses, local, less carbon footprint. Um, that to me is a stepping stone in the right direction for sure to, to um, look at it from a much higher level. And the other thing is, I mean, if it's organic, yes, it has much higher standards. It doesn't mean, though, that the organic organic standards don't say don't chop down all of these trees. It says don't chop down. It says chop down. You can chop down all of those trees, but then you can't put glyphosates on your soil. So it really is about doing some research on 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 um, the products that you're buying looking at um, looking at emblems looking at you know if it's sustainable what is their sustainability to me it's still if you can't if you can't if you can't email a question to a company and get the answer that you want to get from someone in that company that actually knows then I would search for a company that I that I could. And I know that that's, that's not as easy to do, but I think that people, people need to start trying to do that more and more. You know, if you can make your own stuff is all is great. Um, I know around here and I even I know in Vancouver, more and more people are doing this really, and it, it's bringing communities together, especially now after COVID, which is, you know, it's, it's really nice to see people are going to local farmers markets and stuff and then doing group canning group um uh freezing group uh pickling group so so you you go and you buy a whole bunch of fresh stuff that you know where it's come from you know it's not been sprayed you know that it's been um uh i would say eco-friendly grown right? Which is more of a, um, you're, you're not buying something that is a thousand acres of the same, of the same product or the same vegetable, 
you're actually grow buying it if you can and purchasing it from farms that grow a lot of different things, but in smaller, smaller batches, because that is what is ideally better for the world if you can. But what we could do in this, I, my apologies that I wasn't able to do this, but um, we, we talked about that member stuff and then we just didn't have time about looking at different logos and emblems and things like that to, to try and, and put out for people to be aware of and what they really meant. So maybe when I have a minute, we can do something like that. Maybe we can put something really small together about steps of what you can do first, which is like I said, see if you can buy local community, um, be able to buy, let's say if you're, you know, if you're in the US, buy closer into the into the state, like the, the, the states that are closer to you. The same with, if you're in Canada, buy it in the provinces that are closer to you. And, you know, going to farmer's markets, a big one. That's a, that's a huge one. So maybe we could do something like that and and um, send it out to the Facebook group. Yeah, yeah, I'll um, I'll add it to our agenda for sure. Okay. If that's going to be helpful for everyone, then let's do it. Awesome. Okay, Jim, are you still on the call with us? Let's see. Oh yeah, there you are. Um, if I remember correctly, Jim, you don't have a mic. Uh, do, would you have a homeopathic solution, Julie? Now we're moving into the Q and A for. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to look. I just, it's way too, um, I don't know. Uh, what are you thinking? I'm just looking at, um, I just want to, how do we stop industrial farming? So Jackie Henderson asked, how do we stop industrial farming? Mm -hmm. Jackie, if you're still out there, that's a Billy and I are going to talk about. So that's a, that's um. I think that's a really good one for everybody because that industrial farming hits everyone, like every single person. So trying to find farmers that are like, it's called no till or it's called farmer's footprint. And we will, we'll be, Billy and I will be talking about that and how you find um, companies and farms that, that do no till. It is, it is unbelievably more healthy for our environment. Um, let me just look at another thing really fast. And my parents may not be flooded. Oh, yeah, see? And they call people in BC tree huggers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so I was just looking. Did you look through some of these? The chat? Yeah, I did. Yeah, a lot of a lot of conversation here about okay. our planet, the earth. I mean. Yeah. So I just wanted to make this really quick too, because I think some people know and some people don't know um, what they're doing to old growth is freaking criminal. It, it's true. So just like, and I'm not blowing my horn. I'm really not trying to blow my horn. It probably sounds like I'm blowing my horn, but I'm not, I'm really trying not to. But when I, with our mushrooms, when I was trying to find medicinal mushrooms, I was having a really, I mean, I've been using medicinal mushrooms in my clinic for 25 years. But when I was trying to look for a supply of medicinal mushrooms for adored beast, I had a really, really hard time because the majority of them are grown in labs or they're growing on in logs, but on tarmacs, like on big, huge, you know, in big, huge, open spaces where their log force have been cut down or almost it's almost like um like a football field that is almost like pavement like a parking lot and then and the logs are on that and then the mushrooms are grown on the logs and um it it I really couldn't find anything that I felt comfortable purchasing in 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 the way that I wanted to purchase so it spurred me on to doing my own eco, my own eco forestry project or rewilding project, where my goal before I die is to do two things. One is to show the world that forests are worth more than pulp and paper. Because if we can find a way, which is what Adored Beast has been working on for now for about three years, 
um, if we can find a way to go to grow things naturally in the forest and harvest it sustainably, which means being able to go in and harvest it where you're not disrupting the rest of the, the, the ecosystem within the, the, the floor of the forest. Um, I think more and more people will be interested in that. So my, my hope is to be able to, to grow the medicinal mushrooms, which we're, which we are doing right now, but not only medicinal mushrooms, but other kinds of herbs so that we can cultivate and, and, um, cultivate forest herbs and forest medicinal products and um, uh, allow the forest to have a different way of, of producing income for the for the for people. So instead of someone going, I really need money, which happens a lot, I really need money. I have this 200 acres of forest. And I don't want to sell my property because it's been in my family for years and years and years. So I'm just going to sell the wood off of it. I'm not going to sell the property. I'm just going to sell the wood off of it. Instead of them doing that, I'm trying to create this, this project where we can teach people to keep their forests and grow the mushrooms and grow the herbs and and produce a product to make money without cutting down their trees and support the wildlife. And it's, it's a massive undertaking that I'm taking on, but, but what we're doing with it, and I'm working with Dalhousie University on it too, to see the value of, um, to see the value of uh, producing ingredients within the microbiome of the soil and does that affect the medicinal value of those ingredients? And I can tell you without even having all the research done that it's impossible for it not to. So it's a, it, like I said, it's a really, really big project of mine. And then I'm also doing a lot of, as you know, algae and phytoplankton. I've been doing that for, for five years now. Um, research to see if I can create more and more ways that the industry in general, not just not just adored bees, but the industry, the whole industry can choose a healthier choice for not just their animal, but a healthier choice for the environment and the, and the oceans. So that's my point I'm getting back to is that's what you want to do is you want to try and find companies and support companies that are not just becoming sustainable for their in industry, but ask them, how are they becoming sustainable to the planet? What are you doing in your company that gives back to the planet and isn't just taking from the planet? What does your sustainability mean? Don't, don't ask them and they'll say, well, we will know that our, um, we'll know that our, you know, that we'll be able to pick this and do this and have this for you. It's sustainable for, you know, we have, you know, for a hundred years, it's sustainable or whatever. But it's, it's just talking about the industry. It's not talking about what they're giving back. So to me, sustainable means not just making sure that it's there for a long time, but actually giving back and healing. How are we healing the earth and giving back to the earth? So when you're looking for labels and you're looking, the smaller the, smaller the companies, the more you're going to be able to dig in and ask the questions and get your get your questions answered okay Steph yeah fabulous thank you thank you very much all right I've got a few questions here from um attendees and and they'd like to help with their their adored beasts not only the plant yeah, sure and sure so Jim Jim's been on here before and I believe he he um joins us with his wife. So they have a homeopathic solution for their 14 year old Tibetan Terrier. He has a loose top incisor. His gums are red around the tooth. He doesn't have tartar or bad breath. 
We've been working with Dr. Charles Loops, homeopathy, and Dr. Jean Dodds. He's been on- I'm trying to, trying to find it on the question, just like- The in, very first one at the very top. The very top one, the yeah. Jim Duff? Jim Duff, you got it. Okay. Um, so he has been on cephalexin, 500 milligrams for 10 day course, two times. We have your go-to. We wanted to also ask if we should be using Phytos Flora after the antibiotics. We don't want him to be uncomfortable and just want his tooth out somehow. We can't risk a dental at his age. So they're not taking the, they're not taking the tooth out, right? That's, that's what I'm understanding. Yeah, the dental at this age. Well, I mean, sometimes what'll happen is they'll just, it'll just fall out. But um, his gum is red around the tooth, but he doesn't have tartar on bed. So I just wish I knew what they were doing homeopathically. That's a hard question for me to answer because I don't know what Dr. Loops is giving. Because <laughs> there's lots of, um, encephalexin is a homeopathic remedy. I mean, a, as an antibiotic. Oh, I was thinking it was a homeopathic. No, cephalexin is an antibiotic. And he's been on it twice. So I wouldn't even wait till he's out till the antibiotics are done. I would be giving Phytos Flora the entire time, um, just spaced apart. But I would be asking your homeopath to, this is a hard question stuff because I don't know what remedies he's been on, right? right? There, lots and lots of remedies that work like antibiotics. So there's remedies like um, pepper salt and there's remedies like silica and there's remedies like pyrogen and there's remedies like nitric acid and there's tons of specific remedies, homeopathic remedies that target tooth decay, right? Calc fleur, calc foss, um, arnica, I'm seeing uh, Arnica here, homeopathic Arnica from Jim. So that's all I, what? Yeah, just homeopathic Arnica is what I'm seeing. That's all? Uh, as far as Jim's written through to us here, yeah. Yeah, so in my opinion, I, I mean, I can't, you're, you're working with a homeopath. I would ask him if he could go on for now, a combination remedy, combination homeopathic remedy, that targets the infection, right? Really, really, really targets the infection um, and pain because there's definitely lots of them, probably 30 of them that I could think off at the top of my head. And I would definitely have this dog on liver tonic for sure. So that it's dealing, helping deal with the bacteria. Um, phytosynergy is a really good one. Mm -hmm. So that they're because of the superoxide dismutase um, in it to help with inflammatory stuff. M medicinal mushrooms like turkey tail is incredible for the immune to to um, for the immune system. And then I would talk to Dr. Dodd and Dr. Loops about doing something for your dog's heart. So um, putting him on like something like coenzyme Q10 or some kind of um, supplement that supports the heart because when the, when the gums are really infected, then that bacteria showers on the heart valve. So it can, it can play a, a little bit of havoc on the heart. So I would definitely be speaking to them about them recommending um, a heart, a really good heart supplement, uh, you know, our potency is, is really, really supportive, really supportive for, for the heart. So I would probably have them on something with high DHA and an EPA, DHA even, even especially, and a supplement. So that, that really helps with the heart. Um, ask Dr. Dodds and cause she's awesome. Ask Dr. Dodds about amount and what you could give as far as a supplement for his heart goes. And then um, phytosynergies, phytosflora for sure, a medicinal mushroom and, and lots of, um, lots of uh, homeopathic remedies. And he's 14 years old 
and you're, you, you, if you can't do surgery, you, you can, that's, that's when combination remedies are absolutely, in my opinion, life-saving, brilliant, amazing. I can't, I can't say enough for specific combination remedies that your, your homeopath would put together for you that would address the pain, the infection, your heart, her, his heart, inflammation, the whole, the whole nine yards. Thank you, Julie. Um, okay. Yeah, they have the new um, uh, potency. Great. He's using phytosynergy, liver tonic, and turkey tail. That's fantastic. That's good. That's okay. good. So now really, really what he needs is to, to speak to Dr. Dodds about a specific, and it's something else, maybe extra for his heart, like coenzyme Q10 or something like that. And then speak to his homeopathic doctor about doing a combination remedy. Thank you, Julie. Fantastic. Um, Mindy has a question here. Is hair loss normal when treating yeast, such as when there is a yeast die off? Good question. Hair loss usually happens when, like, if it's if they're really getting bald, like that that black stuff, black skin and stuff, that usually happens when the inflammation is so bad that it destroys the hair follicle. Right? It, mm. It's it's traumatizing the hair follicle. I don't know if it's. I would. I don't know if it's. I I can't say it's normal because every dog goes through a different different symptomatology when there's die off. <clears throat> but if you're talking about yeasty beast, the whole thing about yeasty beast is they shouldn't be getting worse before they get better. Like adored beast is all about having, um, not having detoxes and not having big Herx reactions and creating that symbiotic homeostasis very gently and really um, without a lot of, without a lot of trauma or discomfort. So I don't know what she's using for yeast, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily, unless the hair was so damaged that it needs to fall out so new hair can grow. I mean, I have seen that with some dogs, but I can't, I can't say it's normal because I don't know what the exact, exactly what's going on with yeah, the dog. I know my guy, before he got onto the protocol, he was itching himself. And that was one of the things that I was like, oh, you know what? Maybe this guy needs the yeasty beast. Uh, and he was itching. And, and so, and he would pull his, his fur out. Like he was. Oh yeah. When they have yeast, yeah. is it normal to have? When they have the yeast, it's super normal for them to lose hair. Yeah, they get they get that almost like elephant skin, that black, thickened skin with no hair. Yeah, I've seen. So that. It, it's very very normal. Um, if you get a Herx reaction, <clears throat> if you get a Herx reaction, um, then then that's a really intense die off, which is what we're trying to avoid with yeasty beast. So sometimes when you're trying to address yeast and you're really going at it and you're in your intensely trying to kill yeast, then the yeast, if the yeast dies too quickly and you get a Herx reaction, then it can almost look like they have a really bad outbreak of yeast again. But really that is the, the, the die off is happening too quickly and that can happen. In that question, I don't, I'm not, I'm not clear why she's thinking that there's a die off if it's just started with, you know, using yeast beast or, or something else that she's trying to do with treating yeast. Mm -hmm. I'm not too um, sure. Mindy, you let us know and, and we'll, and we'll swing back around. Okay. Lauren has a big question here. Cocker Spaniel named Snowball. Um, she's 13. She's always been deaf. And a couple of years ago, she lost her sight. Um, ever since I've had her since she was three years old, she's had food sensitivities. 
Um, she has in the past and she still does get itchy scabs on her skin. I treat her with either cold pressed hemp seed oil or shea butter in order to remove them. Also removing small clumps of fur in the process, yeah. I'd also bathe her almost every 10 days. In addition, she gets discharge in her ears. It's happening more often as she's getting older. It's like almost every day doesn't go by when I don't hear the sound of liquid when she shakes her body coming from her ears. It's uncomfortable for her when I clean them. She'd rub them for a long period of time. I don't always use an alcohol-based solution either. Um, uh, we had to give her up for six months last year. The couple that took care of her managed to alleviate quite a few of her symptoms. That's great. Ever since she's been back in her care, I've been following the protocol that was left with me and the symptoms have come back again. Is it possible my dog is allergic to her own fur? Um, it seems like her condition gets worse when her fur gets longer. She's on a diet of canned hydrolyzed chicken, which is prescription diet for skin and sensitivities by Hills. Um, before I was sick, I had her on a raw meat. It was always beef. Chicken was supposed to be a, a food sensitivity issue of hers. I've treated her in the past with yeasty beast protocol. Um, it didn't seem to help. Out of curiosity, would I give her the homeopathic tincture, the yeasty beast one, away from food, just as if I were taking them, like 20 minutes away from food? Is it possible that the alcohol in the homeopathic or the other tincture um, could be affecting her system as well? I'm on a tight budget. Um, is there anything you could suggest, Julie? Gut soothe, love bugs, something along those lines. I would, first thing I would do. So did she say she's, she started doing what the person that had her for six months didn't say how the sim lauren are you on here can i give you the mic you could probably explain this better than i can oh yeah here you go let me know if that works and you can hey are I'm you here. here yeah i'm here can you hear me yeah so so in the time and hi lauren hi uh, I, in the time that, what did they do to change? What did they change? Well, they, they started, they, they gave her the hydrolyzed. Uh, the Hills diet? And you, the, you know, the, the, the friend of mine that took care of her, she was also into natural methods as well. So she was kind of not certain about giving her this food, but they said, well, the thing about the hydrolyzed, because it's hydrolyzed and it, the body doesn't recognize this protein right away and so therefore and you know um yeah. so i said okay and, and she also made sure that she got lots of vegetables because snowball loves vegetables a lot um yeah. i i we made sure i made sure that she didn't give her any kind of uh, high sugar concentrated vegetables like carrots and stuff like that um as a matter of fact i had taken her to a um red paw which is uh, they they try to figure out what food sensitivities of of the animal are uh energetically um so in any event uh they they changed by changing her diet it seemed like they were able to reduce some of the problems that she had but like i said when she came back into her care it was like it was like nothing new it was uh, the, the same problems that she had before um do you do you have like rugs in your house and things no. like that no 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 rugs is, is there anything environmentally that's that's a lot different like well we're like living in old... st Catharines now we used to live in toronto okay but it, it's just that it doesn't it, the the thing is is that it just doesn't oh and our friends were living in toronto as well um it, but I mean, in your house, like, is there anything in your house that 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 could be like a, that she's sensitive to, or anything in their house? Like, did they have an air purifier machine? Or did, well, the thing they, they lived in a they live in an apartment that's um, I find is more toxic than the apartment than we're than we're living in. Um, <laughs> the and I, I don't mean any disrespect to that. It's just that, you know, the, how things are in that place. 
I, to be honest, like I don't use any kind of uh, uh, harsh chemical cleaners or anything like that. I'm very much into uh, uh, what do you call it? The um, essential oh, no. oil type cleaners. Yeah. And even vinegar and, and all those other kind of things. So if she eats anything off the floor, unfortunately, you know, we walk on the floor from with our shoes sometimes. So yeah. you know, things can come there. Um, I, I, I'm really at wit's end as to try to figure out what's what's going on. What, what and, is so and... like laundry detergent? Sorry for interrupting. Well, um, we're using non-phosphate uh, soaps. Oh. Um, I'm also, I, I try to use something called the uh, pink solution um, and uh, again, alternative cleaners that are non, that are non-toxic. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like I've done everything under the sun as, I, as, as that I could think of to keep mm -hmm. things as natural as possible for the, for the sweet girl. But, uh, and when you said her hair gets longer, had she just been clipped or anything before she went? She, she was clip before she she was back she went, on her. she was clipped before she, she went to the other people no she was she was clipped before she came back to our care now I, I i tried to make sure that she get she got as many you know her, her fur is cut as often as possible um it's not she always itchier when her fur is long well it seemed that way so that that's my partner seems to think she might be allergic to her own fur, but I, I, I don't know. I, I've never heard of anything like that before. No. Now she's an, she's, she seems to be an albino dog because she's all, she's all white. She has gray eyes and, um, her autoimmune system. What is she? Pardon? She's a Cocker Spaniel? Cocker Spaniel. Yeah. Hmm. So, I mean, they're prone to having ear problems. Well, I was just gonna say, as far as her ear problem goes, um, Dr. Judy Morgan sells this really amazing thing on her on her uh, website or on her in her store called Zymox. Zymox? Zymox. I would touch her ears unless I was using that. Like, I guess a vet's looked in her ears before, obviously, right? Yeah. And she doesn't have like a like a punctured eardrum or anything like that as far as i know she doesn't now okay. one of her ears has a growth um over it which uh, prevents uh water from getting out properly yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. they're they're so prone to that cocker spaniels um but you should you should go on judy morgan's site and and tell sort of just cut and paste or just basically say what you've what you said there about her ear yeah and then they have something called an enzymatic it's just the enzyme i wouldn't get the cleaner or the solution i would just get the enzyme because you actually don't clean it you you put the enzyme in and you and you rub it around and then you just let them shake it out and it's it's it i it is incredible. It's like probably the best thing that I, I used to use it at my practice all the time. Huh. And maybe just just um, ask their um, their customer service. Just you know, tell them that I recommended that you talk to them, right. and just and just tell them the symptoms of her ear, and um, and I would I would definitely try that. Like see what they say, but I would definitely. If they, if they think it's a good idea, I would definitely try that. It's it's done wonders for dogs' ears that no one um, no one has ever been able to like figure out their ears as far as what to put in them. Right. I used it for a long, long, long time at my clinic, and it was incredible, like really, really good. So I would I would try that. I I don't think she's allergic to her hair. Right. But, you know, maybe she's getting, like, I'm just trying to think, like, if she was, if she was clipped when she went, I'm just trying to find some, some little piece in here of what changed when she was there and what changed when she came back. Did she have shorter hair when she went there? And then her hair's grown since she's come back. If you clip her before, do you do you see a difference in, in that she's not as as itchy? Um, 
Does her skin smell? No, her ears smell, but her skin is not. Yeah. It, and it, does it get? Her skin gets very rough, and and it, you know I, I would I would be in the area trying to help alleviate the area, and you could tell she has a lot of itchiness problems, and I I, I always thought there was a yeast infection thing there that was going on there. Not necessarily, and I wouldn't I wouldn't bathe her. I would stop bathing her and 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 use our um our recipe for the the yogurt mask and just rinse her. I would try to, I would try to stop bathing her for a while and and instead put her in the bath with the with the Stephanie, you can put it in the chat or tell them where to look for the yeah. the um the mask. Absolutely. Uh, there's a whole recipe of how to do it. I would try that a couple times, okay. and instead of um, in, in, instead of using love bugs, so that's less expensive. What I would do is I would put her on on phytos. I would try her on phytosflora. Phytosflora. Phytosflora, and then I would use a small amount of phytosflora in the mask. That way, you don't have to buy two different products. So if, if you're mm. trying to cut your cost, and then I would just do that and then you rinse them off with chamomile tea chamomile and green tea so you rinse them off with water and then just do one last rinse with a chamomile and green tea and then you leave that on so instead of using any kind of i wouldn't use any more soaps on her at all and i would and i wouldn't i mean if the hot if she's back to being crazy itchy and her ears being bad and 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 whatever i would um i would i would I would, I wouldn't bathe her. I would try the Zymox and you could try the yeasty beast. Um, if you still have, do you still have the homeopathic? Yeah, I do. Remedy? Yeah, I do. Yeah. You, you can definitely try that and you can definitely do it 20 minutes away from food. Um, it's just that I, I don't like giving it to them directly in their mouth if they're sensitive to it. So that's, and if you want, if you, if you think she's sensitive to, I don't, I can't imagine her being sensitive to the alcohol, but if you think that that might be the case and also to help you save money, take a dark glass, like a, like a cup, like take a, like a teacup that's either ceramic or, but like not clear, Yeah. fill it up with some distilled, get some distilled water, put distilled water in it or spring water in it. And then take the Yeasty Beast. Stephanie, is our Yeasty Beast a pump or a, or a eyedropper? It's a pump. The pump, isn't it? pump. Okay. The pump. No, not topical. You're not talking about the topical, are you? No, it's, it's you're supposed you're to- You're talking about the homeopathic, about. right? The yeah. protocol. Yeah. 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 So then take, take it and put six pumps yeah. into the water. And then put, a, then put a lid on your cup like a saucer or something. Yeah. And use that same water for like four days, right? So you're using your hot, you're using four pumps in four whole days. It completely disperses the alcohol. She won't taste the alcohol at all. You'll save money that way. And then you stir it and then you can open her mouth and give her a teaspoon of it. Oh, you can do it that way. And then it goes right into her mucous membranes. It doesn't taste like alcohol. You'll save money on you know you want to buy another protocol in order to get the remedy right and i would try that with her just twice a twice a day or maybe three times a day for two days and then twice a day for three days okay. and see if it and see if it decreases her itching and don't don't do any more baths do the mask and talk to Dr. Um, Morgan about go to Dr. Morgan's site and get try the Zymox. So it's called the love bug mask, you said. It's called the love bug mask. I would use phytosflora and I would start giving her phytosflora. Uh, Lauren, I'll reply to your question with the recipe. It's also in the chat. Okay, thanks. And thanks. then keep your customer service updated, right? So. Kaylin and everybody in customer service, Suzanne, they're all really, really amazingly trained and really helpful. And um, let them know how she is 
and then we can we can try to help support you through this too. That's great. Can and I, make can, sure that you let let Dr. Morgan know that she's got a um uh, okay. a growth in her a growth in her ear. Okay. And you said uh, pump six pumps of the East TV East one into the into that dark ceramic cup of water. And you yeah. Said two to three times per day for two days. Yep. Yeah for two days and then twice a day for three days and stir it every single time you give it to her, stir it. Stir it. You're, you're changing the pot, you're changing the potency a little tiny bit when you do that. Um, okay, two to three times per day for two days and then two times per day for another two days. Yeah, I would do it three times a day okay. for two days and twice a day for three days and see how she's doing. If she's doing really good, then you can go to once a day for like another week and then stop. And if she starts itching again, you can start it again. I see, okay. And then after four days, you dump that water. Yeah. And you just do the same thing again. Okay. Wow, okay. Cause that, that will help you financially and it'll ease your mind about anything about alcohol. And you can do it 20 minutes away from food because you're going to just pour it right in your mouth and she's just going to think it's water because it just tastes like water. It, uh, you said it's a teaspoon giver. And yeah. now, uh, does it matter if it's metal? No, it's fine. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Keep us posted. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, Katie. Julie, I suspect my dog Nina, a nine-year-old Chihuahua Papillon, has leaky gut because she has a history of severe respiratory allergy episodes. They're cyclical every eight weeks like clockwork. Each lasts for about three weeks. Some blowout skin allergies last year, as well as GERD. After being on gut soothe and Fredo's flora for three weeks, uh, and then I switched to Mercola Complete, she suddenly started breaking out in hives immediately after consuming them, as well as healthy gut and even the Marcola. Uh, just one sixteenth of a dose would make her break out too. Even a month and a half later, it's still happening. I'm wondering, how can I do the leaky gut protocol if I can't use the gut soother probiotics for inflammation reduction and gut rebalancing? She has no history of yeast issues. She's been on liver tonic since... February 16th, raw fed for two years. I've worked with a holistic vet for two years as well. So she's got, so, wow. Um, hang on, let me look at this again. She's got history of severe respiratory allergies. Every eight weeks, like clockwork, and each lasts for three weeks. Some blow up skin allergies the last year, as well as GERD. After being on gut soothe and phytos floor for three weeks. So I'm confused about this. Started on what? Started what? Started when? Why don't I, uh, February 16th, why don't I give Katie the mic here and let's ask her. Was switched from Mercola Complete Probiotics. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so I had been giving my dogs the Mercola probiotics for a long time. And then yeah. my other dog actually ended up having an issue. So I started her on gut soothe. And so I thought, cause Nina's issues had not been getting better. And we've been at it for so long. They actually seem to be getting worse. I'm like, what the heck? So I started her on the gut soothe as well. So I was doing a dose of that with breakfast. Sorry, I had to open my door. I let my other dog in. <laughs> and then doing Fido's flora with supper. And the GERD seemed to kind of slowly get better. She was not in any other kind of episode at the time. Um, and then on, like all of a sudden, after being on those for three weeks, I had given the dogs some raw fennel early, like in the afternoon. And then I fed them supper, which was rabbit, which they've had for the last couple of years in a rotation of five plus proteins, she blew up in hives, her legs and feet and ankles and everything. I thought, oh crap, it must've been the fennel. That's the only thing different. It was brand new. So I didn't give her fennel again, but the next morning I gave her rabbit 
and she blew up from that. And so kind of talking to my holistic vet, she thought that it it likely wasn't either of those because then for a week and a half, Nina was getting hives from everything. Every time she ate, no matter what, she was getting hives. If she was like excited, anticipating food, she got them from her snood. I live in Wisconsin. So we would go out for a walk and so carry her in her little backpack and have her all bundled up. And even just her snood, like resting on around her eyes, she was getting hives around her eyes. So it was like, everything was giving her hives for a few weeks. And so I had stopped the probiotics that maybe it was die off or something like that. And she, you know, that was causing issues. So I'd stop those for a few days and things would kind of calm down. I thought, okay, well, let me try a little gut soothe again. She would get hives right, right away afterwards. And I try, I experimented with the phytos floor a little bit like that too. I thought, okay, well, maybe it's one of like the, maybe like the larch or something. I don't know, just thinking of yeah. ingredients that yeah. she hadn't had before. Yeah. So then I tried the Mercola um, again and she got hives right after that too. So I'm like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> She's just yeah, had such miserable larch. issues. She doesn't have larch in that. Anything else? Like anything else happening? Like you didn't move, you didn't. You didn't no. Move. And and this just happened on um, February 16th? That's when I started the gut soothe and phytos flora. It was three weeks after that, that this all blew up. Um, okay. But like I said, be, before that, for the last couple of years, even because I started raw two years ago. So that's when we started the whole journey of like the nutrition, the homeopathy, all that. She's had several um, different homeopathic remedies that we've tried. She's been on Rust Tox 30C yeah. for the last five months now. <laughs> we actually just gave her a dose, a wet dose uh, Thursday last week. Um, but yeah, every eight, it's crazy. Every eight weeks, like clockwork, respiratory stuff comes up again and it gets so bad. Like she's so congested that she can only breathe through her mouth. And then she has post nasal drip that, you know, she only has one hole to breathe from. And when stuff's dripping down there, she's just, it's like three weeks of total misery all night and all day. And I just am trying to help my baby and I don't, I can't. Who's, who's looking after her? What that? Um, her name is, um, Jessica Levy. She's in Andover, Minnesota. Okay. And, and she's doing the homeopathy part. Uh-huh. Yeah. We've been doing that since day one. I, a few that I know we've tried, I think like Nux Vomica in the beginning, we've tried sulfur, um, Cali, Carbonicum. Um, should, I'm sure there are others, but. You should ask, and are you doing liver tonic with her? Yeah, so I started that at the same time on 216 as well. Okay. Um, both of my dogs were sharing it. And so I did two bottles in a row. So I guess she's te technically been through one bottle total, but so she's like nine and a half pounds, but she's been on it for a couple months. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, I don't know. I, and I, I just don't even know how I can do the leaky gut protocol if every time, like if the probiotics or something no. in the gut soothe are causing hives. So that's why I was just going to say, maybe you should ask her, your vet, mm -hmm. if she can put her on, just put her on NAG. So, and acetyl glucosamine. Um, see if she can just put her on NAG for now and maybe something like has she been on quercetin? No. Mm -mm. Okay. So, and like, I would be looking at stuff more like nag, quercetin, turkey tail, um, okay. just, just for now. Right. Because okay. you don't know, is it the slippery elm or is it just, but, but then you went back to Mercola's and they don't have that in it. Yeah. So, and then, so it's gotta be something it's odd, but more than anything, and I'm and I, I can't tell you how to use it or anything because I'm not gonna overstep like this 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 vet. But two things you could do. I'm I'm really seriously thinking that she needs a, a particular remedy that I'm thinking about. If she wants to um, reach out to our customer service, like just give them give her the email. Okay. I would be happy 
to talk to her about what I think she should do homeopathically with your dog. Cause there's a remedy in my head. That's just screaming at okay. me that I would love to put her on. And I can't, um, okay. first of all, you probably couldn't get it. You'd have to probably get it through your vet. Okay. Cause it's a, it's a nose ode. Um, okay. but I really, really think, especially that cyclical thing, the every eight weeks thing. Mm-hmm. And I, and it addressed, it would, I would hope that it would help her with her skin allergies, her GERD, her respiratory stuff, the hives, you know, if she wants to reach out to customer service, they'll give me her, ad- her email. Okay. And I would be happy to, to email her and just okay. say, I would try this remedy. Okay. That would be awesome. So should I, should I try to do that before like the quercetin and the, yeah. the nag? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'll even tell her that I'll even say to her, this is the milligrams and this is what I would do. Like I can, I can let her know um, mm-hmm. what I, you know, what I, because I, I think the nag is so helpful with, with the, with the um, uh, mucosal lining as an anti-inflammatory for the co- the mucosal lining. It's so, okay. so helpful. So I'm really hoping that it'll help with, with her post-nasal stuff mm-hmm. and her herd and okay. her gut, right? Um, the turkey tail will really help with her immune balancing. Like phytos- I, you're on already phytosflora because all mm-hmm. I'm thinking of is immune modulation, right? Mm-hmm. So what, Larch has immune modulation and so does, um, so does phytos flora, but mm-hmm. so does turkey tail. So okay. turkey tail doesn't have, turkey tail has amazing prebiotics in it. It doesn't okay. have probiotics in it, but will help to support and grow more health bacteria in our gut. At the same time, it might help with, uh, with the immune modulation. If we can do that with her and then like when she calls me or emails me, I'll tell her what remedy, you know, I would ex- I'll explain what remedy that why I'm looking at a particular remedy for her. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then I can talk to her too about quercetin and stuff, but with her, I wouldn't try too many things at once. Okay. With her, I would honestly probably try turkey tail in this homeopathic remedy. That's what okay. I would do first. I'm also giving her some of the um, phytoplankton like every oh, few good. days. That's really um, good. the SOD in it. Okay. I've kind of been alternating that with the Mercola um, mushroom complex that I had on hand. So it's kind of like, oh, well, today we'll put a little bit of this in and, you know, just kind of playing with stuff that I know that's healthy to, to And it doesn't, it doesn't bother that. Those, those ones don't bother her, right? It doesn't seem to. I mean, she had been, she had tried the mushroom complex on and off for a few years and she was fine with it. Um, I don't see any issues with the phytoplankton. Um, I bought, of course, a leaky gut protocol for my big dog and, and Nina. And now then I was like, shoot, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I shouldn't do like the rebalancer or anything either right now. Like, could that Has she ever been? A, so did you give her anything from the leaky gut yet? just the liver tonic because I have, I realized that it was something in the pro I think, I think it's actually the probiotics. I mean, who really knows, but since Mercola is causing it too, I, I didn't know how to proceed with it. So can you, no, is, I haven't. your big dog on it then? Um, no, not yet. We just oh. got it in the mail like a week and a half or so ago. So, okay. but I've just kind of been a standstill. Like, I don't know what I know we need to heal her leaky gut but if she can't do the stuff that's in it <laughs> do you want your other do- what I'm, I'm what I'm saying do you want your other dog on it oh do I want my other dog on the- yeah I want I would like to bolster it because Ari my well, big dog has GERD too so well definitely start it on your big dog but I definitely okay. would not start it on on Nina okay I would not- I would I would be worried that something else other than leaky guts going on with her, like okay. she's having some kind of insane histamine thing because histamine can even create GERD. It can create all, I mean, it could be leaky gut as well, mm-hmm. but if we, I would try the remedy just to try and like stabilize whatever, 
Like right now her immune system is way out of control. Yeah. It gets way, way, way too high. Yeah. So I would be doing everything right now to, to bring her immune system down naturally. So not, okay. not suppress it with like steroids or, or whatever. Oh yeah. No, for sure. I wouldn't. Because that's, that's probably what they would want to do. Right. Because, because mm-hmm. her immune system's too high. So if, if to try and balance her immune system and, and, and um, modulate her immune system, mm-hmm. I would do this remedy and I would do, keep doing phyto synergy for sure. Okay. And I would try the turkey tail and, okay. and then this, and this homeopathic remedy. And that's all I would do. I wouldn't do anything else, but if your other dog has GERD and has issues, your, your bear dog, mm-hmm. then I would definitely gut soothe is really, really amazing for, for GERD. Like it's okay. really help. And it did help your little guy right? Your little girl. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Before, so, I'll, before I'll up. I'll lose. Yeah. So yeah, definitely don't use it on her. Use it on your other dog okay. and, and have your, have your vet reach out to me. Okay. And because I really, I'm really hopeful that this, that this will help. And I think that, you know, it would be something that this particular remedy is very, very helpful for chronic disease, like really okay. helpful. Okay. So for, so it'd be the turkey tail, the phyto and this remedy, no liver tonic, no di- even like digestive enzymes or anything like that. I have the Mercola digestive enzymes on hand too. So. I would stop everything that okay. you had started around the same time. And I would stop everything that you've added sort of since then. So okay. I haven't started any the enzyme she's been on the whole, I mean, for a long time just to yeah. you know help I don't and... think it, well then if she's been on it for a long time I can't see it hurting okay. unless it's really strong right sometimes sometimes digestive enzymes with GERD either it really helps or it can be not so good that's why I don't want you to use the protocol because we have digestive en- enzymes in yeah okay. and sometimes it's too much if, if there's too much acid sometimes digestive enzymes Expe- makes it expediates it. it even helps the it makes the digestive juices even work more and okay. if, if her if her um if her sphincter isn't working correctly and she's getting acid reflux mm-hmm. and sometimes if that reflux happens when she's got the enzymes when she's actually producing even more enzymes mm-hmm. sometimes that can even be more irritating okay so i would take it i would take it with with this dog i would t- i would use everything that's super chilled like okay. really really easy and calm like phytosynergy is is very on non-reactive okay. and the um turkey tail is super non-reactive it's it's all really I want to say benign, but powerful, mm-hmm. you know? So, and then I would do the remedy. Okay. I would yep. kind of bring her right back to okay. the bare minimum and then add, give her the remedy and then add things. One, one thing, like literally every three to four weeks. Okay. Like so that, no, no that omegas problem. either. So cut out the, oh, I have Mercola krill oil for her right now. So cut that out too. Like none of that I would stuff. Stop, I would stop anything that you started since she's whatever caused this thing okay. to happen. Okay. She's been on krill oil for a long time too, um, okay. which now I feel now that I know after presentation, I'm like crap. <laughs> I give her krill oil. <laughs> um, well, you don't want to stop things that are helping her right now. Right. Yeah. So if you know for sure that she was okay. I just wish I knew what was the exciting cause it's called. I, w- I wish I knew what was, what triggered it, right? Yeah, well, that's what's so weird because like I said, I thought it was the fennel and then the next morning I didn't give her any fennel. I was like, okay, we can live without fennel, not a problem. Gave her a rabbit, which she had in her protein rotation for a couple years and just blew up too. So, but then, and then everything, like I said, even the fabric laying on her face was causing hives. So I'm like, yeah, I feel like she's not allergic to any of this. I feel like it's, I feel like her autoimmune, autoimmune. just like got mad maybe because of too much, too many probiotics 
at once or something and she's like what are you doing to me <laughs> I'm trying to help <laughs> yeah she just sounds like she's decompensating a little bit from something like that that something is triggered an immune immune mediated reaction and you just haven't been able to get her histamine or her immune system to to slow down okay right the, that's what that's what this remedy does this is what that, that's what this remedy really targets okay so, and it would target like the the cyclical respiratory target all that in addition should. to whatever this episode is it should okay it really really help yeah Thanks. and then i would add things like really really three three weeks to a month add one more thing okay i take right. a lot of a lot of stuff if you're not 100 percent sure that it's not triggering it i would take her off of it okay and then even like the rabbit should i not feed that to her again you know even what i for a long time I, I would put her on another one just because i would take her kind of like like ask your vet but i would sort of take her off almost everything Put her on a different protein, give her the homeopathic remedy and just let her body chill for a bit and then start adding one supplement at a time. Okay. But it's so, oh shoot, I think you just turn on. So it's okay to, I mean, I have a rotation of like beef, bison, elk, chicken, and then I was doing rabbit. So should I only do one protein for a while you're saying? I would. Okay. She, that won't like make her allergic to it that's what you always hear don't do one well, you, for you, too long. except if you keep giving her rabbit when she's in this allergic state that's exactly what you could be doing with rabbit okay well yeah and i haven't given it to her again since we started since, well, a month ago when all this started so. Oh, so she's not on rabbit now she's on the rotation no. yeah so she i took she had rabbit that night that I thought it was the fennel and she had it the next morning with no fennel and then I was like that's it I'm not going to do fennel or rabbit anymore until we figure out what's going on because my vet said didn't she thought it was like an autoimmune thing versus the fact that she suddenly just yeah. became super allergic to rabbit that she's yeah. had for the last couple of years but yeah she's so but I've she's just had it and even not on rabbit right right not she's not blowing up the same way that it took a week and a half or so for her to stop getting hives to everything mm -hmm. but she's still getting it from probiotics I gave her a little bit of like bison pancreas I blend them up and put them in cubes I gave her like five percent of her meal of that the other day that got a little hives reaction so it's it's dying down wow. but it's still because I'm like oh well like supports like so maybe this would help the GERD a little bit if I give her a little pancreas or I don't know I mean I'm always just I'm just trying to do anything I can to help her yeah I think she needs something stronger like I think she needs a homeopathic remedy that targets that that's what I okay. think and then and and less is more and then just start adding things once really really give her body a chance to stop overreacting and then start adding things back okay how long then, should I after I, she's oh go ahead if you start adding things back and then all of a sudden she's she blows up again then you know chances are that could be the culprit right that particular thing could be the culprit or 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 up or up and it's something called an exciting cause like something that actually triggers triggers the deeper mm -hmm. deeper issue mm -hmm. but i would definitely be trying this this other remedy okay mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Katie. Well, yes. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. You're so welcome. I just message customer service with Dr. Yeah. Levy's contact info and okay. You got it. Yeah. Or I, I would give your vet our contact info too. Okay. Or ask your, I would ask your vet first if she's open to talking to us or talking okay. to me. And mm -hmm. if she says yes, then, then contact customer service. Okay. And say that your vet is open to hear what homeopathic remedy I would recommend. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank okay. you so much. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Okay. Um, we have to wrap this session up because it is getting late. Yes, I know. Um, listen, everyone, if I know, I know there's a few of you here that we didn't get to your question, and I apologize. 
But like Julie said, our customer success team is phenomenal. Um, you're not going to find a, a team anywhere else in the entire world that'll that'll support you the way that ours will. So please send your questions, copy and paste them, and send them to our service, our customer service team, because they'll give you a hand. They'll they'll search our blogs. They'll get resources. They'll give you our our veterinarian and holistic um, list. They they will help you. Please email us questions. It's plural questions at adoredbeast.com and we'll do our very best to give you a hand. Thank you, Julie, for your time, for your presentation. You're um, welcome. For, Thank you. I'm just going through these questions. It's like, oh my gosh. I know. Please, you guys, please email, please email us. Please email us because we will try. Yeah, for sure. mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, a, lot of these, a lot of these things we could address through customer service for sure. Yeah. And um, don't forget that on the 21st, we're going to be talking, well, Julie and Billy Hochman are going to be talking about regenerative agriculture. That is 21st of April at seven o'clock Eastern. Thank you for everything tonight, Julie, and we'll see you then. Thank Good night. you.